Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with free step by step repair guides, high quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll ever need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout. Today, de your DJI drone, uh, taking a look at an Instamorph project that's not horrible. And uh, should your car be automated? Coming up on Know How. Welcome to Know How, it's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next 50 minutes or so, we're going to show you some of the projects that we've been working on, geeking out to, so that you can take them home and be a weekend geek warrior. But before we get that, yeah. get to that, we have a, a cool story about solar power. Yeah, specifically, if you want to see the future of solar power, take a trip over to paradise. Now, now Brian, <laughs> you know I love solar, right? We've done some yes. solar projects on yes. know-how. It's, it's that whole idea of being able to convert sunlight directly into usable electricity. There's something very cool about that, very sci-fi-y. Very sci-fi, very clean. It's very, like, using the energy around us without, right. you know, in Destroying, destroying our environment. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like you want to say it a nice way, but like, yeah. no, no, without destroying things. Yeah. 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 Now, okay, now the uh, construction of solar panels can be kind of toxic, and we're working on that. But when I was a kid, the solar panels that I had to work with, and normally they were tiny, because remember the yields back then were horrible. Right. You were lucky if you got something with like 5% efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, solar panels just weren't great. We've increased the yields, and we've also increased the efficiency. The theoretical maximum efficiency of a solar panel is about 30, 33, 34%. So for the amount of sunlight that's hitting, the, the energy that it's able to absorb is 34% of it? Yes, we'll convert directly into electricity. Into electricity. And, and, and that's not bad, that's not bad. But we are finding that when we start to build these huge arrays of solar panels, which are great, mm -hmm. there is one problem. There's and some issues there. There are some issues. And the biggest issue, as it has been with most forms of alternative energy, is we need to generate power when there's a demand for power. Right. And that means when, either if it's cloudy or if it's dark. And or if the wind's not blowing, if you have a wind farm. If the wind's not blowing. And then you have, yeah, you have to store that energy too. Exactly. Now, for the old traditional means of generating power that we have on our grid, like uh, it's coal, or nuclear, that's not a problem because you just increase the reaction or you increase the amount of fuel that goes into the boilers and you can up the amount of power that you generate. Right. But if you've got a resource limited alternative energy source like solar or wind, you can't really do that and you do need to have something to store. Now, here, here's a big thing. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a really good system to store power, you can run into horrible, horrible issues. Specifically, you kill the batteries on which your grid runs. Right, because they are start, they decharge and then they yep. increase and then they decharge again, and it's all according to how much sunlight you get. Yeah, we, we know this. I mean, we've been playing with big batteries. Like this is a brand new one I got from my quadcopter. This is a a five amp, fourteen point eight volt battery. Mm -hmm. This thing will keep my quadcopter in the air for like thirty minutes, uh, but. Although this is great, we've talked about this when we were talking about quadcopter technologies, batteries have a certain amount of discharges and they have a certain amount of power that they can push out or bring in at any right. given time, right? Remember how, how these work. You've got a dielectric and you've got some way of pushing power through an insulator into the chemistry. Well, you, every time you do that, you damage that insulation. You do it enough times and it just doesn't work anymore. Right, so once again, uh, the limiting factor is battery technology is right now. battery tech. And, and if you don't have good batteries and battery tech, this is what happens. You see, mm -hmm. our grid runs at 100, uh, in the United States, but you can substitute your own power grid wherever <laughs> you live. <laughs> yeah. Our grid runs at 120 volts, mm -hmm. or 110 volts actually, and 60 hertz, so 60 mm -hmm. cycles per second. If you have 
a solar farm and like a cloud passes over the solar farm, you could go from 100% production to 20% production in a matter of seconds. Right. And right. that is a huge, huge dip. If that solar farm is the primary source of a grid at that particular time, what will happen is you'll actually start to decrease the hertz. You'll, you'll like drop down to 40 hertz. You push 40 hertz power through a grid and you will blow out appliances, Ooh. destroy things that are connected to the grid. So is that when you get like brownouts and things like brownouts, that? Brownouts, right. It, it's, it's actually a brownout is better than then having, what? having that happen because oh. you, will, you will destroy large appliances. That's like super, super bad. Ooh. And so we use batteries to fill in that gap. Well, we need a way to do that on a larger scale than we're doing right now. And it's actually happening. I think hmm. we have some uh, some pictures here of the installation in Kauai. Right now in Hawaii, <laughs> they've got a grid that's providing between 50 to 80 percent of power through solar panels. Hmm. And in order to do that, they had to have a fantastic battery plant that could th that could f fill in those gaps when they when they had that problem. Here's here's the problem that they ran into. They built this thing thinking that this was going to last some, somewhere along the lines of five years. So this, this battery plant was supposed to be able to fill in the gaps for five years. They're finding that after just over a year, the batteries are nearly useless. They've, they've been used so many times, they've been cycled so many times, that it's, they're just gone. So that's bad news. That's, that's bad news. And it also means, well, it, you can't really have a grid if you don't have a way to balance out the power. They've been, lo they've been looking at other alternatives, maybe having turbine generators that can spin up really, really fast mm -hmm. so that you can, you can like tide them over. But even then, you still need an interim source of power, and that's going to be batteries. Ah, geez. This, yeah, this seems like a difficult compromise to have to... But if they need someone to volunteer to <laughs> check it out in Hawaii, I'm more than willing. Luckily, <laughs> we actually solved this problem on know-how a while back. Did we? Well, not, not really, oh. but we talked about the solution <laughs> a while back. And that would be? Uh, remember when we, were t when we were talking about those batteries uh, that had uh, titanium dioxide in them? Oh, rust, Yeah, right? rust, it was yeah. rust. They had titanium rust inside of the chemistry and they were able to rapidly charge a battery on a bus. So the battery that would be used for like an electric bus yeah. in 45 seconds, get all the charge it would need for an hour of operation. Right, we talked about how they could implement it at bus stops or intersections and then charge up the bus as it went along. Exactly, and, and the cool thing about that is uh, by, by they figured out by adding titanium rust to the chemistry for a lithium ion, uh, lithium ion polymer battery, mm -hmm. you could get a very, very stable chemistry that can take a lot of current at any given time and push out a lot of current in, in any given time. And instead of lasting 100 or 200 cycles, it would last 10,000 or 100,000 cycles. That's exactly the kind of battery technology that we need to, to smooth out those dips. That, so are they, gonna, are they working on that? Is uh, they're, that they're where they're things of, are going? It's, it's where things are going. They're, they're looking <laughs> at a couple of different operations because right now that's still experimental. They have to get the yields up. Yeah. But the interesting thing is when you look at alternative energy, that's the main problem right now. It, it's not, the, it's not the, the power that you can get from the alternative energy system, right. it's storage. And now it looks like we actually have some tech that looks promising enough to be that storage. That, yeah, because I always feel like uh, we're living in, not, not the stone age, but this is the early days of battery technology still, and we're still trying to get that next leap in, uh, in storage and yeah. being able to hold on to the capacity. Because once we're able to nail down that problem, uh, it, think of like if we could charge up our quads in just a few seconds too, and not have to worry about. <laughs> it always comes back to the quad copters. <laughs> it really does. It does. But charge those up and electric cars uh, and everything. Dale Poco is saying, "Oh, it's a big battery for Hawaii. So do you check the voltage by licking the contact? <laughs> Wait, did you ever do that when you were a kid? With did the you nine check volt the battery? Ah. Yeah, yeah, I did. Although I do find it strange that uh, so it's on Hawaii, but. I, when you, I first read this story, I imagined that it was going to be volcano, like thermal <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. energy. Because that, that would be a constant source of energy. But. It would be con And actually, uh, when you think about it, using the, the, the lava flows, using the heat coming off the big island of Hawaii would be per perfect because it's not a violent volcano. Yeah. It's, it's a very predictable volcano. But the problem there is that it's, it's actually a sacred space, and I don't, oh. I don't know if you well. really want to be running a <laughs> Yeah, okay. Well, let's figure out the battery thing, I guess, first. <laughs> I, I lived in Hawaii for a couple of years, and, uh, yeah. and the locals would go crazy anytime they saw videos of people, like, throwing soda cans into the lava flow. Oh. It's just, you know, 
People yeah. live there, folks. It's hey, be respectful yeah. and don't fly drones over it either. Then, no. <laughs> Let's go do that. Do that. All right. Now, uh, we are going to be getting into a little bit of a fix. It's not a quadcopter project, per se. We're not doing mm -hmm. a build-out. But a lot of people have contacted us about their Phantoms, Phantom 1s and Phantom 2s, about a problem that, uh, unfortunately, many have embarrassingly <laughs> suffered. Well, especially if it's the first one you ever you try and use. Yeah. There's probably something you're going to run it into Absolutely. and then have to fix. And, and we're going to show you how to not just fix it, but to make it better. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the first sponsor of Know How, and you know it's got to be iFixit. Now, Brian, both of us use iFixit almost exclusively for, for our quadcopter stuff. At my desk, at the ready, I have my iFixit toolkit and the magnetic pad because there's never a time that I'm not... What? Tony Why? took it. <gasps> Sorry. Better not have, because yeah. uh, every day I go down, I'm always taking something apart and putting it back together. We have to hide this one. So this is the one that we use for the ad reads. We have to hide this kit yes. because people keep taking them. We because need to hide it in my office oh, now. Okay. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, when you think about repairing things, I fix it has to be the choice. And, and you know, we've got actually some video here that shows you some of the things that I've been doing with my I fix it kit. I, it, it's, it's my regular go-to pack whenever I have to reassemble a quadcopter or fix something that I've broken. iFixit isn't just about tools, though. It's the place for all the port parts and the know-how that you need to fix all your stuff. Macs, iPhones, iPads, Android devices, from broken screens to dead batteries and everything in between, iFixit is the place to go. Uh, DIY, DIY repair saves you money. It's convenient, and more than that, it teaches you how things work. Learning in the process is probably the best thing of all the world. And best of all, iFixit makes it easy with the highest quality parts and step-by-step -step repair guides to walk you through the repair. iFixit has also dozens of displays and battery kits for all sorts of devices. Oh, right now, Brian's got in his hands two of the, the, the boxes that we've been playing with here at the studio. This is a, a screen for an iPhone 5S. Uh, if Alex goes to the overhead, that will show you you know, these, these kits are like self-contained do-it-yourself packages. If you've got a broken screen, you can, you can ask, ask not just for the tools, but the parts themselves and that step-by-step -step repair guide that makes it easy to get your device back up and running. Uh, every iFixit kit comes with all the tools you need to fix it the right, uh, fix the right way. Penelope drivers for Apple proprietary screws, spudgers and plastic opening tools for precision plying, suction cups for pulling and display assemblies off of frames, replacement adhesive for parts that need it, like the iPhone 5 and uh, the 5S. It also has pro-grade replacement parts, parts that are tested, giving you peace of mind that the part you receive works. And they're guaranteed, unlike a lot of the other things you might buy off of eBay. If the part fails, iFixit will make things right. iFixit offers the best tools and repair parts, and they also have the best step-by-step -step guides to show you exactly how to fix that device that you're working on. In fact, they have a comprehensive repair guide for every single iPhone, iPad, and Mac computer, plus a growing list of Android devices. And these repair guides are free. That's right, no purchase necessary. iFixit makes DIY repair fun, easy, and affordable. So here's what we want you to do. Support know-how by going over to ifixit.com slash twit for all of the tools, parts, and kits you'll need to fix all your broken stuff. Enter the code knowhow at checkout and you'll save ten for ten dollars off any purchase of fifty dollars or more. That's ifixit.com slash twit. ifixit.com slash twit and use the code knowhow. And we thank ifixit for their support of know-how. Yeah, and uh, for this next uh, deburkifying project we have, you'll probably be handy to have an iFixit kit. I can keep this on my side of the table. Don't be selfish. That's mine now. <laughs> you, you get your own iFixit kit. No, uh, but folks, uh, honestly, one of the, the most asked questions we got in our quadcopter forums is about the Phantom. Now, we have, we have opinions about phantoms. I like I mean, DJI. This is by far the most popular drone that I've seen and it's definitely one of the ones that's gone mainstream with uh, video footage and things like that. Right. I mean, uh, the Phantom and the Phantom 2 are really the ones that made drones or quadcopters, whatever you want to call them, popular. And that's because they were so easy to buy and they were so easy to fly. But it also means that they were very incredibly easy to break. Right. As 
quad is natural to do when you start playing with quadcopters. Do you uh, do you want to explain what happened to this uh, this particular craft? Uh, I feel like I've explained it before. I, I want to hear. I don't it need again. to explain it so. again. It's it certainly wasn't me just assuming I could fly it straight out of the box <laughs> and not. It, you know, they are simple to fly, but the manual that came with this is very. How, they're easy to get in the air, but it takes a while to learn how to actually fly them. The problem I had was that uh, I had to plug it into a laptop and then set the props for the proper rotation. Uh, so <laughs> the advice I got from you one time was that it wasn't, it, some gas. it wasn't flying correctly because I wasn't giving it enough throttle and it wasn't. And I was like, okay, like I'll try it. And I sent it up about 300 feet in the air and it was still wobbling. And then it was flying over some trees and I panicked and it flipped in the air and I threw the throttle back on and then it just went straight in the ground, broke like all the props, broke a bunch of other stuff on it. And then I think I gave it to Burke to try and fix it and I, it, it was unrecoverable at it was that un point. But what made it unrecoverable was a mistake that a lot of Phantom owners make. And that is, if you remove the prop guards, which a lot of us do because they're big and they're bulky, and, and once you kind of learn how to fly, you don't really need them anymore, the screw length is different because mm -hmm. it goes through the prop guard into the motor. And what happens is they take the screw out and then they put it back in without the, the prop guard. It goes all the way into the motor and actually damages the coil. And Ooh. once you damage the coil on the motor, that's dead. It's dead. Don't even try to re rewind it. Dang. Yeah, yeah that's, probably, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So let's take a look at some of the things that we need for this fix. Uh, we, we need motors because that's what we burned right. out, right? Well, we've been playing with a lot of those. So. Uh, and uh, here are a couple that we've, we've uh, been playing with on the show. This one is, an, we're going to give you links to this, so don't worry about it. This one is actually an Emacs 2213. You buy these on Amazon a lot. Uh, you can get a, a four pack of them for 60 bucks. So if, you know, this is a, a perfect motor replacement. It, it even fits the same props. It's the same size. It's it's ex almost a perfect match for the motors that came with your, your DJI. And they look cool too. And they look cool. This is something else. This is a house motor that we got from Ready to Fly Quads. Uh, this one will run you about 10 bucks, which is not bad. So, you know, you go down from $15 to $10. To $10 and now the repair is not all that not expensive. It's It's not a great motor, but it's a good enough motor. Actually, it's still better than the ones that came with the, the DJI in the first place. That's what you've you've kind of explained to me after you've taken the DJI apart, is that it's not nearly as sophisticated as some of the other drones that we've been building for less. Right, yeah, and and actually, if we open this up, you'll see that we've, we've made a couple of alterations. This is not actually how a DJI drone op looks when you first open up these Speed controllers are original, and everything else has been changed. We've just been mucking around <laughs> with this. Uh, it, but it, it good cause, because yeah. we basically destroyed everything in crashing and then taking it apart and then destroying the motors. Right, right. right, right. We're trying to bring it back to life. We're trying to bring it back to life. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to show you a few more of the alterations that we've made to our Phantom mm -hmm. so that maybe you can do it to yours. But uh, without further ado, hey, Alex, push that magic button. Oh, that one. Click. Boop. Sorry. We'll, we'll, make a, we'll, we'll, make a little, we'll make a little cut right there. And I'll just kind of I'm get totally that not going to remember to cut that and, out. Uh, yeah, okay. Let's just pretend I'm going to that right now. The DJI Phantom and Phantom 2 are some of the most popular mass-produced quadcopters ever sold. But a common mistake that Phantom owners make is reassembling their quads after taking off the prop guards forgetting that the motor screws holding the prop guards are two millimeters longer than the standard motor screws. This causes the screws to touch the coils in the motors, destroying them. Luckily, replacement motors can be had for 10 to $20 each, and it's relatively easy not just to fix your Phantom, but to modify it for ease of upgrading in the future. The fix starts by unplugging the battery and opening the Phantom shell by removing all the screws on the underside of the craft. Be sure to mark where they came from so that you can replace them after the fix. Once the shell is open, you'll notice that each of the motors is connected to a circuit board in each arm by three wires. Those circuit boards, the electronic speed controllers, are connected to a flight controller at the center of the Phantom. Don't mess with any of the wiring. We're just here to replace the burned out motors. Speaking of the motors, we're replacing all four, so it doesn't matter where we start. But first, take a good hard look at each motor and ESC to make sure that there isn't any scorching on any ESC components. Hopefully you just killed the motors, but if you see popped components or burnt chips on the ESCs, you'll have to replace them as well. 
Choose one motor to begin with and remove the four screws holding the motor to the arm. With the motor free, use a pair of snips and cut the silicone wires at the base of the motor. We could just solder the replacements onto the ESCs, but soldering onto the ESC can be difficult for soldering novices, and we're actually upgrading the wiring so that future motor swaps will be easy. With the dead motor removed, use a pair of insulation strippers to cut away 4 millimeters or so of insulation from the end of each wire. Tin your wires by heating them with your soldering iron until they flow solder into the strands. Now we need to add female bullet connectors to the end of each wire. These are standard connectors that will allow you to quickly replace motors in the future if you need to repair or upgrade your craft. I used a pair of helping hands to heat the bullets before adding some solder and then inserting the pre tinned wire into the solder filled bullet. Make sure not to move the wire until the solder has hardened to avoid cold solder joints. With the bullet connectors soldered, we need to add heat shrink tubing to insulate each wire in order to prevent shorts. Add short lengths of tubing to each wire, making sure to reach the end of each connector, then use a heat source to shrink the tubing. It's okay if the tubing extends past the connector. You can always trim the excess, and I prefer to leave a little overlap to help make sure the leads are completely isolated from one another. Shorted leads means burned out ESCs. Complete the same process for all four motors, then mount your new motors on each arm, making sure to use the right screws, connecting the motor's three leads to any of the three ESC leads. Power up your quad and throttle it up to check the rotation of your motors. The front left motor should spin clockwise, the front right motor counterclockwise, the right rear motor should spin clockwise, and the right left counterclockwise. A piece of tape on the shaft can help you see which way the motor is turning. I use the spare KK flight controller, available for about $20, in place of the default flight controller to make the process a little easier. But if you have the NASA utility installed on your computer, you can trigger each motor individually to check rotation. If any of your motors are spinning in the wrong direction, simply swap any two of the three leads going between the motor and the ESC. It doesn't matter which. Once you've verified that your motors are all spinning in the right direction, assuming that you didn't replace any of the SCs, you can now close it up, put on the props, power it on, and give it a test flight. We've got Chumley in the chat room saying, is this something that we should all be worried about? I mean, not everyone out there owns a DJI drone, but right. yes, actually you can damage your motor. This is probably the most common way to damage your motor after crashing it. Uh, people put the wrong size screws, and if you don't look, to make sure that they don't go too far. If they're even touching those coils, it will damage the motor. Yeah, and then that's end of story. Right. Hmm. And, and I personally, I like having bullets. I, there's a lot of people who say they just soldered in, it's more reliable, but yeah. I like the ability to be able to swap out components. Yes. Uh, someone else in the chat room asked, you know, am I worried about turning this too much into a, a do-it-yourself drone? No, absolutely not. Hmm. Uh, we like being able to build things. We like being able to swap components in and out. In fact, right now, you'll notice in the overhead that we, we got rid of the original flight controller. We put a performance control in here so that we could go acro because the original DJI quadcopter is designed to carry a camera. It's right. designed to be very stable. We wanted to play around, so we, f we swapped out the flight controller <laughs> with one that could be made more aggressive. Yes, I, I, the more and more I look at this, the more I think it's pretty much just a DJI yeah, shell. Uh, shell that has a new quadcopter inside of it, yeah. Uh, it, it, but we're using the original batteries, so I think that makes it okay. That helps, yeah. <laughs> so uh, there you go. We, we, oh, by the way, uh, I should probably mm. mention that we're coming to the end of February, which means we're starting to get back into actual quad builds. We will be showing you a lot more of the mods that we've made to the DJI Phantom, and we'll also be showing you some of the mods that we've made to our 250 class quadcopters, as well as teaching you how to do brand new builds like of this 450 class dead cat. Yeah. Or Alien X. That thing's got some power. Yes, it does. Now, speaking of power, you know one of the things that I've admired the most? Uh, bending. Bending? Well, oh, I, air bending. Yeah, well, well air I bending, see, water I, bending. I, I thought I, you were going for the Kamehameha no, way. That, that would be the <laughs> back here. That's a little different. Uh, now, I, I've actually been a, a fan of the uh, the Avatar series, uh, right. you know, the last Airbender. I saw the movie and I couldn't. I don't no. do that. That's, <laughs> no, just watch watch the cartoon. Cartoon? The okay. It's much better. And Korra, the, uh, the, the sequel to it, mm -hmm. was an absolutely fantastic series. If you haven't watched it, buy it and buy the... Watch the first and the last season. Those are the best. Okay, uh, but why are we talking about a cartoon on know-how? Because 
I wanted to give our audience an example of using Instamorph. <laughs> Unlike us, we suck at it. We're really, really hey, bad at it. We I can are. do my little little guys pretty well, I mean, my little I, army dudes. I can do like trays, and yeah. I can, but I mean, someone who actually has artistic talent, right. who can sculpt, can really bring out what Instamorph can do, which is why we brought in our very own Patrick Del Oh, I'm sorry, we brought in our very own Aman. <laughs> Aman. Aman. Aman, thank you very much for coming into the show. Um, I'm here to take your bending. Yes, yes. If, now, it, spoiler, <laughs> spoiler. Uh, Aman actually dies. What? I Whoa, to spoiler alert. <laughs> he's, a, he's a water bender who can actually blood bend, and he has learned the secrets of taking away other benders' bending. That. Okay, so yes. he's like the Darth Vader yes. of uh, absolutely now. Bending. Uh, Alex, uh, we do have we do have a link in there that can show you actual some actual pics from the series to show you what Aman looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important to see the, the level of skill that Patrick had in in uh, you know playing with the Instamorph to get this. I mean, that's that's what it looks like from the series. Go ahead and scroll through a couple of those, and uh, it's just it's it's amazing the kind of detail that goes into making a mask like this. A uh, Patrick. Uh, show us, uh, hold that thing up. But we actually want to see what you did here. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I heated up the Instamorph, and a then lot you just, of it. Like you just stuck your face the, straight in I, there? I got one of the smaller tubs, and I heated up half of it. Yeah. And uh, I made it onto a flat sheet. And then I went to Joanne Fabric and got this mask. And Is I that put, a Mike Myers mask? Uh, it's a no. creepy mask. <laughs> it is very it's, creepy. It's just cardboard. Oh, okay. But I uh, put had all the Instamorph flattened out on a flat surface and then got it dry, but it was still pliable. And so while it was pliable, I put it inside, inside this cardboard mask and just spread it out and uh, got the shape of it. Uh, now you can see the cardboard didn't come up to the top, so I had to do my own little bit for up here. But that gave me a nice smooth... Uh, surface for the mask and then I added on extra bits like the pointy nose and eyebrows covered it in uh, spray paint then painted on all the details and uh, I've got an Amon mask which I was that's awesome th this is able one to of bring the, to conventions we really wanted to get someone who could do cosplay and and both you and your fiance soon to be wife are are absolutely fabulous at it. You I mean you, you've got an eye for detail, and you've got you've got that talent that you can actually turn an idea into something that's sculpted, which is what Instamorph is supposed to do. Right. Which I could never. I don't have that. No, I'm really happy that uh, Patrick did this project because. <laughs> so yeah, would not, you wouldn't recommend just uh, heating up the Instamorph and then trying to. Uh, yeah, it, right? that, yeah, that was a good question. <laughs> how did how did you get it to conform to your face without being painful? Well, that's how it's I. That's why that. I used this. Okay. I, I, oh. This was big enough for my face. They sell smaller ones, but it wouldn't fit on my face. So I got this right. and then just molded it inside that. Nice. And then all the details I cut out with a Dremel. But I had to be careful because when I used the Dremel, it heated it back up again. Oh, right. yeah. So I, I ended so. up getting a lot of little greebles sticking out just little bits, and I, but I could just pull those off yeah. And, yeah. and adjust it. Uh, I, Patrick, I got to ask you this. Uh, I actually had that problem when I was when I was uh, sculpting some of my parts because mm -hmm. I would make the template and then I would have to cut out like the mounting holes. Right. And so I would use a Dremel tool in order to to, to get that out there. Mm -hmm. And I did notice that it would soften. But I, then I started to think, well, what you know, I can make a part and then soften it enough where I could poke through it with, say, a copper tube. Did did you at all try to to do like selective re-softening, reheating of the mask in order to get the textures? I did. Uh, I there were some areas that weren't quite perfect when I did this, and so I, I like for example with the eyes, I actually softened it back up and went in and pushed the eyes so they could better tell where the edges were and where I needed to cut. Hmm. And then uh, up here at the top, because this mask only goes up to like the lower forehead, I had to do this custom on the top here. So I had to go and soften this up, and then I had to soften the original part and kind of combine them. Wow. And I, uh, so I was dipping it in the <laughs> water in the <laughs> to just re-soften part of it and then yeah. I would bring it out and kind of adjust it and smooth it and yeah. uh, it looks cool did you find it difficult to paint at all they're um, able to uh... I, I used a coat of spray paint and that was 
good. It actually helped co- cover up some of the little holes. But then, uh, because I picked glossy paint, mm-hmm. the detail paint, I had trouble getting that on here. Uh, it just wanted to come off, so I had to do multiple coats. How many but, times did you have to redo this? Because one of the things I like about Instamorph is that if you mess up, you just dug yeah. it back in the water and start Heat over. Heat it up. Uh, did, did, did you get it on your first try? Or, or? Oh, no. No. <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> no, no, no. The, the first try, I just tried sculpting it myself. Oh. And, uh that did not come out very well. <laughs> it looked like my face was <laughs> melting. Uh, and that's when I went out and got this. And so I just threw that back in the water, heated it up, and put it in here. Nice. And, and you so, won an award, didn't you, for it? Uh, yeah, we won. Uh, there was a group of us. We won um, Best Presentation Runner-Up. Nice. Do you so, have uh, any future plans to use Instamorph? Somewhere? Oh, absolutely. I'm not sure yeah. what, but Groot. I f- definitely will go back to it. Now, for Groot, I think I'm going to use... Uh, actual foam okay well but. actually this is a good question then for for people who who do want to start using instamorph for cosplay where where's the cutoff where do you think instamorph falls in for, as a useful material versus i'll use foam or I'll use clay hmm. um I, I think if you're doing something you have a mold for it it makes it a lot easier so like this I, this is just flimsy and it wouldn't hold up but i could use this to make a nice solid mold and this isn't going to change shape unless I like leave it in the car on a hot day. <laughs> but I'm on uh, melt. <laughs> I, I think if you have small things, you can probably like like your little army figures. You could yeah. get little good things out of that. But if you're trying to do something with a lot of detail, it, it gets harder. Well, how yeah. about this, Patrick? Can we make you a deal? Can we keep you supplied with Instamorph, <laughs> and you start to show us the ways of the cosplay masters? Yeah, yeah, and I, I think uh, Svet would love to play with some of this, too. Nice. Fantastic. Patrick Pat- Delahanty. Patrick, do us a favor and put it back on. Oh, yeah, oh, put right. it back on. Take, <laughs> take okay. Here. That's Amon, who works for Twit. Uh, could you please tell uh, our audience where they can find you when you're not being evil? <laughs> um, well, if you're looking for conventions, you can find them at my site at fancons.com. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> now, uh, we cool. are going to go back to CES one last time mm-hmm. to, uh, to do a little something-something with automated cars. Yeah. But I, I should mention, by the way, that uh, Alex needs to get out of here really, really quick. <laughs> so we're and, going uh, to just keep talking. Yeah, so, so <laughs> I want this to go extra long, so when we right. get to the banter, that's, that's what we're going to do. Yep. <laughs> but, yep, yep. Until we get to that, uh, hey, mm-hmm. Alex, we've got a CES bit for all the people who want to know about the latest and the greatest in self-driving cars. Yeah. So once again... Let me just hit that magic button. Push that magic button. Boop. If you've been watching our CES coverage, you know that one of the biggest announcements came at the Audi keynote, where they were able to drive one of their driverless vehicles straight up onto the stage. Now, this car in front of me is actually the vehicle that did the 500-mile trip driverless with a journalist behind the wheel from San Francisco to Las Vegas. I'm standing next to Klaus from Audi, who's going to explain how they did this technological wonder. Klaus, thank you very much for, for talking to us. First, this is based on an A7 frame. Yes, this is completely based on a serial A7 uh, car, as you can buy it today everywhere. You took an existing frame that people can buy today, and you decided to equip it with the driverless technology. Why did you do that rather than go the the super futuristic prototype? Yes, the point is if you stay close to the serial um, architecture and uh, the serial production car, it might be easier to take over um, parts of the functions into a serial car, and that is what we want to do in the next years. We've got a really tech-savvy audience, and they're going to want to know the details of how you made this magic go. So, of course, you've got sensors. What does this do? How does this detect the environment around itself? Yes, yeah, so the sensors, uh, first we use um, different technologies for sensors because each sensor has its specific advantages. We use um, radar, we use laser technology, and we use, of course, uh, video technology um, uh, to get a kind of 260-degree idea of what is happening around the car uh, at the moment. And that is what is coming together in the trunk, in the uh, computers there, to build up um, a perception of the surrounding around the car um, over and over again. So the car has a full, a total view of what is happening around it and can decide which maneuvers are able to take if it has to accelerate or decelerate. One of the big issues has been, well, what happens when the GPS isn't right or what happens when the coordinates don't quite match up to the road conditions? How does Audi deal with that? 
Yes, um, the car really reacts on what it is seeing directly um, in the surrounding of itself. The, for example, the navigation map is a very important information uh, in that driving. Uh, for example, if uh, you are approaching a town or something like that, which would be a situation the car couldn't handle yet, um, it will give a takeover request to the driver in advance and says, hey, there's a situation ahead which I'm not allowed or I cannot handle. Please take over the responsibility for the driving again. We're going to give you more from CES, but just remember the future of driving may not have a driver. It may take a while for us to get driverless cars, but right now the future is here if you're looking for something that self parks. I'm standing next to Reiner Katzman from VW who's going to explain how the e-Golf does it all by itself. Reiner, thank you very much for talking to us. Yes. Thank you very much for being here and enjoying our presentation. Well, we are presenting here the trained parking, which is a concept, and we build it in that car to show what is possible. And we want to see what the reaction of the customers, because we have many uh, open potential customers here on the TAS. And the reactions are very, very good on, on that system already. So what we have done is uh, using sensors, which we already have in the car, as a front-facing camera on in the uh, behind the mirror and the, the ultrasonic sensors here in the car. So we are using the technique, technique which we already have in the car and bringing new software and make this for the uh, smart, uh, smart solution for the customer. Uh, that's really important because unlike some of the other prototypes that we've seen here at the show, you're saying this technology is already in the car. You just have to enable it. And, and if, if customers are watch, looking at this and saying, look, that's a feature I like. I like collision avoidance. I like yes. the fact that it can navigate itself into a, a parking spot. Uh, that makes it an easy sell for you. Uh, the question I have for you is, what did you have to do to enable it? So to make this work properly, what goes into the process of, of making a driverless feature? Well, this is not uh, not so easy, I have to say for sure. Um, well, uh, we have to do the, the, the software design and all the process. But on the other hand, we have to uh, make sure that we fulfill all the functional safety, which is a hard uh, thing, hard fact we have to fulfill. This is a very hard thing we, we need to fulfill to give safety to the customer. I follow Robert Ballas there. We're going to go back into CES. But first, let's see how this works. All right, so uh, Twin TV, we've got no driver here. This is the e-Golf that's uh, available now in the United States. The driver of the system will be available next year, but uh, I'm not going to touch a thing. Do, 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 do. Now, in front of us, there are inductive plates, so this knows where its charging station is. Remember, this is an all-electric car. What it will do is it will remember where those inductive plates are, and when you tell it to park itself, it will automatically go over the plates. It detects that it's now charging, and it will stop. So if you've ever worried about making sure that your, your electronic vehicle has enough juice, well, this will do it for it. I mean, it's a lot like a Roomba, a Roomba that will automatically go to its charging station when it needs a top-off. Now, uh, here's the nice thing. It will take care of itself. It's all locked up. But when I need the car back, all I have to do is I have to press a little button on my fob, and again, the car will do it itself. Ah, this is actually moving. And there's a rear camera. Yeah, it's got uh, the rear camera. This actually drives better than my mom. It drives a whole lot better than Jeff Needles. And don't even get me started about Burke. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Now remember, this technology is actually built into the eagle. So if you buy an eagle, it was basically just the software that they had to modify. The sensors are here, the cameras are here, the, uh, the power steering is already built into the car. So VW is doing a great thing in showing you the future in tech they already have. Um, what I love about that... Oh, hi, I'm on. Hi. Thanks for... So, uh, Go ahead, tell me about that car. Hi, 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 how, you, how you doing? I'm fine. All right. Um, so anyways, what I was Come saying... Come on, does it need cars? I just bend the air around me and... He's a waterbender. Oh. Wow. Oops. <laughs> All right. No, but what I was going to say is, uh, what I love about this technology is everything that they showed off in that e-golf yeah. 
currently ships with the eGolf. It was just software, so they just had to add a computer that was fast enough to be able to interpret the data that it was getting from its existing sensors in order to be able to do that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so right. I mean, that's that's the future of driving. However, there is one little wrinkle <sighs> yeah. to this. Yeah, I mean, there was that BMW story that yeah. got released that, uh, pretty recently. That was that was just this last week. Yeah. BMW, oh, oh actually, it's Three or weeks ago. Was it three weeks ago? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah, right. Because BMW reported that they had 2.2 million BMWs, Rolls Royces, and mini cars that were vulnerable to, <laughs> they call it a hack. It's really, it was just really no uh, non-forethought by engineers. Right. They've got those infotainment systems, the connected drive is what they call it. It uses mobile data connections to give drivers the ability to lock their cars remotely. But BMW figured out that they hadn't really thought that anyone would ever attack the system. And oh, so right. Because who would do that? Who would do that? Some yeah. enterprising yeah. folk figured out that they could use their mobile device to break into any one of those connected drive cars in under a minute. So basically that video game Watch Dogs where they walk around yep. with a cell phone yep. and... There you go. <laughs> That's it. Uh, BMW is pushing an update and by the airing of this show, it should be out. Every car should, should be patched. <laughs> but, should. <laughs> yeah, I hate saying, I hate saying should. Uh, uh, but then the, the, the question becomes, the automation is very cool, but all these systems get tied together. Right. And the issue becomes, you've got engineers who are designing something that they don't really design to be connected to the internet. Right, right, right. Uh, uh, so yeah. the smarter the car, these cars get, the smarter they're going to have to be about the the software. Right, and that's that gets ultra ultra complicated. We see that all the time on the enterprise uh, side. When I'm when I'm doing my show this week in enterprise tech, we talk about these devices from the '80s that do things like water. Uh, they monitor gas tanks and water pipes. Well, they were created before the internet even existed. Right. So now that they're putting them on the internet, the, the security is most of the time non-existent. In right. fact, we just covered a story where there are 2,500 ATGs, automatic tank gauges, in the United States that were connected to the internet that had no password whatsoever. If you knew the IP address, you could connect, and then you could mess with the fuel gauges at a gas station or completely disable the, the pumping network. Uh, yeah, these are uh, some scary growing pains for the Internet of Things. Yes, uh, Internet of Things that probably shouldn't be on the Internet. Right, and uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of a driving enthusiast. I like to drive, yeah. so I'm okay with that. But I do also like the idea of being able to hop into a car and just say, take me to the city. I'm going to be commuting for 50 minutes, so you know, I'm going to hang on to go. my iPad. Yeah. But, but now <laughs> it's a little scary, too. Yeah. The now, hacking. Now, now Brian, uh, we both know, uh, we announced this before, that Alex does need to go, so we should be nice and, keep and, and end the episode. Uh, but instead, Alex, let's go ahead and do that parting, parting shot. shot. Uh, push, push that. You know what's button. really surprised is we never get to the parting we shot. We never do, but like this one episode. every episode, we <laughs> always miss it. <laughs> okay, now this was, uh, we were given permission to play this video. This was recovered from a DJI Phantom, of course, it's always a DJI Phantom, that uh, well, crashed yeah. at the base of this oh. building. Uh -oh. Now, anyone who's seen these videos or videos like this knows exactly what happened. The DJI Phantom <laughs> lost signal and it does what's called return to home. <laughs> so it's returning to a GPS coordinates. Unfortunately, those, those GPS coordinates happen to be on the other side of this building. Right. Uh, the, here's the great part. So it recovers. Whew, the, whew, all is well. Whew, and then, and then right, oh, wait, I just, lost signal again. I'm going to go home again. <laughs> <laughs> ah! uh, this happened on Super Bowl Sunday. Oh, oh, oh so sad. So, oh, so sad. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the man who recovered, <laughs> who recovered this drone, uh, yeah. he actually returned it to the owner. Oh, well, that was nice. Uh, which was really nice. I guess, the, so the guy must have had his address like labeled on it. Well, knowing. no, he put it on YouTube, and he said, does this belong to anybody? <laughs> and the guy came forward, and, and everyone in the comments was like, you should have turned it into the police. This right. guy, oh, are you <laughs> kidding me? Can you imagine being in the building, you know, having a Dunk. sip of coffee? Like, what the heck was that? And then that? again. And then, <laughs> it's coming right back for us. Everyone get down. <laughs> but he, this, the really horrible, horrible part about yeah. all of that is that was downtown Honolulu. That was, that was Waikiki. That was yeah. right next to the beaches. Which means it's an incredibly populated area. Yeah, that could have easily have that, landed on somebody. That could have easily, yeah. or the debris could have landed on somebody. That's you know, just don't don't do that. We're talking about pilots doing stupid things. That's a stupid thing. Don't <laughs> do it. Now, 
the, the thing is, the DJI yeah. Phantom did what it was programmed to do. Yes. If yeah. it loses signal, it returns home, which is why you never fly it in an area that has uneven terrain, like downtown. The other one that I remember seeing before that was the uh, guys flying it in a canyon. And he, it's this beautiful landscape, and then, oh, it starts going home right into yeah. a rock. pillar of rocks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, cool feature, but uh, this is where I actually agree with the FAA. Uh, and that is, you, your drone should always be in line of sight. Absolutely. It, if yeah. you're flying beyond line of sight, you're just asking for things like that. Because if you can't see it, you can't react to something that's happened. <laughs> Yeah, there that, that was go. a silly video. I'm glad nobody got hurt, though. I am, too. Now, folks, we know that this was a lot of material, especially the fix for the DJI Phantom and for the tips that Patrick had for his Amon mask. We're going to make sure that we get all those into the show notes, which, Brian, where can they find? They can find them at twit.tv slash kh, and all our prior episodes are... Uh stored in loving order on the on the twit website and you can also find links for uh for subscribing too so you can download the hd video if you prefer or whichever yeah. whichever strikes your fancy whatever version you need for your device of choice you can get it from our show notes uh, show notes page also don't forget that we've got a google plus group with over 8,000 users it is a fantastic community for makers and diyers yes. we've got people who have been doing it for years and people who are brand new to the game be it interested in quadcopters, networking, building your own computer, whatever it might be, there's going to be people in there who are like-minded. Jump in. And that's especially a good place to go when you want us to show off your work because we pull a lot of our ideas straight from our G Plus community. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely saw a lot of uh, quadcopter people who got some over the holidays and stuff, and now there's questions on how to fix Every some things. <laughs> Deburking things. Exactly. <laughs> that was my favorite. My, my, my favorite ones are, so I got that quadcopter you told me to buy, and um, how do I get it out of a tree? <laughs> it, flew into, there. it flew into a skyscraper, <laughs> a skyscraper a couple times, and I can't find it. <laughs> Could you point me to the right place? Right. Have you seen any videos on YouTube? <laughs> oh, also, if you don't like G+, you can always find us on Twitter. That's also a good place to give us ideas, suggest guests for the show, or just check out what we do. He loves to ride. I love to fly by quadcopters. You can mm -hmm. find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. And I am at Cranky underscore Hippo. Yeah. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balliser. And we won't waste any more time we won't trying waste to and introduce you know, actually, Alex You know, Alex end. really needs to go. <laughs> yeah, oh, no. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Wow. You can follow that empty chair yeah. at an L3. See, this is Twitter. what happens. This is what happens when your show goes too long. So, <laughs> uh, well, I'm Father Robert right. Bowser without an L3. And I'm Brian Burnett. Also without an L3. Without an L3. And now that you know how. Go do it. Do go, go do stuff. Stuff. Alex left, so you need, you, the audience right. needs show, to go. The show just doesn't work without <laughs> Alex. Just walk. It's just I'm out. I'm out. Oh, wait, I'm taking this, man. Hey. Look.